Broadcasting live. It's America's longest running talk show on computers. It's Computer America. Bringing you the biggest names in technology with guest interviews, new products, and your emails. Listen live at ComputerAmerica.com on any device around the world. Email the show at live at ComputerAmerica.com or find us on social media. Be sure to check out our website for contests, giveaways, show notes, live video stream, podcasts, and more. You're listening to Computer America. Hello and welcome into the Computer America Show. We are the nation's longest running nationally syndicated radio talk show on computers and technology. Thank you for joining us. I'm your host, Ben Crossman, and I hope all of you had a great weekend. And I would say 4th of July weekend, but that is going to be coming up in the middle of the week, as I'm sure all of you know. But something you may not know is that traditionally, Computer America has taken off the 4th of July. Uh, you know, been really easy when it's been on a Sunday or a Saturday or a Monday or a Friday. But uh, in fact, hey, uh, it's on a Wednesday. So, well, we are indeed going to be taking that day off. So Wednesday, be sure to tune in for a Best of Computer America. And then we'll be back at it bright and early uh, Thursday afternoon. So be sure to uh, to check that out. And in the meantime, once again, welcome everyone. I hope you had a great weekend. You got to relax, got to unwind, and you got to stay out of this atrocious heat. And hey, you're joining us now. So with, uh, let's see, a couple things. So today on the program, we have an entire segment dedicated to computer and technology news for the entire hour. So if you are, uh, you know, if you have not been keeping up to date, don't worry, we have you covered. And there is a lot to, of course, cover. So, oh, and looks like, uh, and we'll mention that in just a minute, but um, yeah, so the entire hour, computer technology news, and by the way, folks, if you like to know anything about today's show, be sure to check out uh, ComputerAmerica.com, that will have all the show notes, links to everything and anything, and hey, you can find that at, once again, ComputerAmerica.com. While you're there, check out the social media contest brought to you by Logitech, and be sure to check out the live video stream brought to you by OWC. And, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, why don't we go ahead and get started with computer and technology news. And as usual, our technology or our new segment is brought to you by OWC. So that's the second time I've mentioned. I should probably uh, explain a little bit. You can check them out at OWCDigital.com. And they make a bunch of different parts and a bunch of different uh, external hard drives and uh, things like that that you know they're really really well made really well tested uh they definitely put a lot of warranty and make sure that you are getting the best product when you buy from them and they also carry that very cool kind of apple aesthetic it's uh you know very clean very uh, modern kind of look to it so definitely check them out OWC. you won't regret them and uh yeah so with that being said computer and technology news why don't we go ahead and get started So uh, let's go ahead and let yeah let's go ahead and get started talking about computer technology news. So there's a bunch of stuff that's been happening over the weekend. Uh, one of the most notable is what's happening with Comcast. If you are a Comcast mobile user, then you're going to want to hear about this story here in a little bit. But there are a number of stories I definitely wanted to cover, and it's uh, let's start with some good news. So let's see if we can pick out some good news. Let's talk about <laughs> what's good news. Um, man, I just realized not many, uh, not much good news. All right, how about we talk about Tesla? All right, easy enough. We have two Tesla stories. We'll get them out of the way early, and we'll go ahead and move on uh, from there. But hey, some finally some good news for Tesla. If you haven't been keeping up to date, they've had a string of bad reports here over a little while. And, well, they just shared one of their biggest milestones in a while. So, this is uh, coming to us from CNBC. And, you know, before we even get started, just to let you know some, uh, you know, because we talk about Tesla a lot here on the show, uh, we're definitely fans of what they do there and, you know, their work towards making a mass-produced, affordable electric vehicle. And, well, they've been hitting snag after snag. 
Uh, their stock price has been taking a hit. Their production rates, as always, like <laughs> there really has not been a time when Teslas don't, um, you know, when Teslas don't hit uh, some kind of hiccup or don't meet their deadlines. Well, it looks like investors were finally having enough of that and people were starting to question the viability of Tesla because they were also hemorrhaging money. They had enough money to kind of ride them out through the next couple of quarters, but beyond that, it was starting to look sketchy on whether or not Tesla as a car company would be able to uh, continue on. Well, that being said, and you know, there's a bunch of uh, other stories to go along with that, but with that being said, Tesla has hit some very important milestones at the last minute that have led a lot of people to think, well, maybe Tesla isn't, uh, you know, isn't a dud after all. And so here we have, again, CNBC, uh, Tesla hits Model 3 production target, but shares turn lower. So some good with some bad, but hey, they said that Tesla said it produced 53,339 vehicles during the second quarter, up from 55% from the prior period. Not half bad. And so that's the main thing, was that they were able to turn out a lot more cars in a lot shorter time. And production totals definitely needed to go way, way up if they were ever going to start selling cars and actually making some money. So, Tesla said Monday that it met a closely watched goal for production. However, it fell short on deliveries during the second quarter. So, the electric car maker's shares initially traded higher following the news, but gradually erased gains to turn lower on midday trading. Tesla said it produced about, again, 53,000 vehicles during the second quarter, an increase of about 55% from the, from the prior period. So... Uh, they said that about 28,000 Model 3s, and Model 3s are the really important one because, you know, the Model S's and the Model X's and, uh, you know, some of the more expensive uh, Teslas, those are certainly important as well. They're kind of what got the Tesla company started, but the Model 3s are the cars that they're going to sell to the masses. They're going to sell a lot more Model 3s than they will the Model S's and the Model X's at a bit of a lower price margin. But hey, when you're talking about the difference between a $35,000 car versus a $100,000 or $150,000 car, a lot more people are going to be looking at purchasing that $35,000 model. So to see those up, that's definitely important. They said that, uh, again, 28,000 Model 3s have been produced, which is triple the amount from the previous quarter, and an additional 20, almost 25,000 of the S's and the X's, which, uh, yeah, you know, hey, which is double than the amount before. So they called it the most productive quarter for Tesla, uh, it, I'm sorry, the most productive quarter in Tesla history so far. So, in, in total, they have delivered about uh, 41,000 vehicles. So, they produced about 53,000. They delivered about 40,000. And that means that they actually fell short of what Wall Street had kind of expected. And if we've learned one thing about stock prices is that if you want it to go up, never, ever, ever miss what they want you to do. Because then they will be very upset with you and they'll take it out on your stock price. So, yeah, let's, uh, let's see, let's uh, scroll down here a little bit. But saying that um, while the second quarter delivery numbers will get a fair amount of attention from analysts and investors, the story driving Tesla shares higher is the Model 3 production and whether the company can sustain a higher output rate for its newest model. And to put this into a little bit of perspective, uh, the reason that a lot of people are, are excited about Tesla again is the fact that while in total they made like 53,000 cars, uh, this last week alone, in one week, they're doing this thing where they have a constant production rate and then they try to bump it up and see if they can do, you know, like if they on an average week, they can do 3,000 cars, they'll for one week, 
they'll tell everyone, all right, hands in, heads down, we're going to try to make 5,000 cars this week. And so for one week, they'll bump it up to 5,000. Everyone will be stressed. They're going to put their production facility to its extreme, and they're going to see exactly what they're capable of. And they did that where this past week they were able to produce 5,000 Model 3s in a single week. So, of course, a quarter, uh, let's see, a quarter is about 12 weeks. If they can do that in one quarter, they should be able to produce about 60,000 Model 3s alone. So, uh, this, you know, this previous quarter where everyone was kind of looking, uh, was looking up, they made about 29,000 Model 3s, and now they're showing that they have the capacity to produce about 60,000. So, they can double their production of Model 3s in a single quarter if they get all their ducks in a row. And then beyond that, Elon, being the uh, the ever optimist that he is, saying that uh, Tesla is now expect is now expected to increase production of about 6,000 Model 3 vehicles per week by late August. So in about a month or in about two months, it says that they're going to try to produce 6,000 a week, which you're looking at what is that? About 72,000 cars a quarter. And Elon, of course, as I said, Elon being Elon, says that uh, with minimal upgrades, they could even get that number up to 10 to 12,000 a week. If they start producing 10 to 12,000 a week and they actually get them delivered, that's another big part of this whole thing, then that makes Tesla much more much more attractive where they're actually putting product in people's hands instead of promising a shiny toy that will never see most of its customers. So that's why people are excited about Tesla. Uh, again, its price has uh, been fluctuating up and down, but for all sake and for Tesla's sake, they've seen a big uh, string of bad news in recent months and this is finally some good news so yep there you go tesla and speaking of good news tesla is more than just its car production uh, side of the company but they also make this thing called the power wall and energy storage is turning out to be a pretty big part of what makes tesla tesla so here we have it. This is from Engadget as well, Mr. John Fingus, saying that uh, Tesla's next California energy storage project may be its largest yet. And energy storage is going to be a huge part of what makes the energy grid, you know, kind of possible here in the coming years. I didn't pick up the story. I did read the headline, uh, not, you know, didn't cover it. But in the UK, you may have heard of that place. They recently left the EU or at least pledged to, but the UK, they have in, let's see, this weekend, I know in the United States, we had this massive heat wave. Again, I hope all of you are staying cool and you're staying out of it as best you can, or you know, dealing with it as best you can, but that heat wave is also extending into other parts of the world. Yes, there are other parts of the world. Yes, we kind of care about them, and uh, yeah, because some, sometimes we send them things like tablets and stuff, but uh, in the UK, they also had a heat wave. And with the heat wave, with lots of sunshine, with lots of uh, high temperatures, things like that, they were able to make it so that this weekend, I think it was over the course of the whole weekend, or maybe it was a short period of time, but either way, solar outproduced uh, gas when it came to generating electricity for the first time in the UK. So renewable energy, and especially solar, you take it as you can get it. This heat wave is not exactly going to stick around forever, uh, much that we hope. But when it does, you know, when high winds come or at least, you know, decent winds come when good solar energy is able to be produced, you want to take advantage of that. But then you don't want to just dump the electricity somewhere. You want to be able to store it and use it when times are not as good. I don't know, maybe something crazy happens like, uh, you know, the heat wave dies off or the uh, or the sun goes down, whatever comes first, and you use the electricity when you need it. So, as I said, storage is going to be very, very important. So, and and uh, yeah, someone in the chat room is giving us our, uh, 
our weather forecast or our current temperature. So with, uh, with that being said, Tesla, they said that their giant Australian energy storage facility may seem small in the near future, which by the way, it's anything but small. It's actually very, very large. One of the largest battery arrays in the world, but uh, looks like California could be getting one here in the near future that will make that one look minuscule. So Pacific Gas and Electric has submitted proposals for four new energy storage projects in the California Public Utility Commission, one of which is for a facility at its Moss Landing substation that could output about 182.5 megawatts over the course of four hours. And they said that that's more than 3,000 of Tesla's Power Pack 2 units. By the way, each one of those units costs about $3,500. or $3, So you do the math, or I'll do it for you. That's about $100,000 worth of batteries in four hours. That's a lot of batteries. So they're saying that for context, the Australian location outputs just about 129 megawatts, and the project could have a total capacity of about 1.1 gigawatt hours capacity, which fits Elon Musk's recent hints that Tesla could have a gigawatt hour scale deal within months. So they're saying that the batteries would, as elsewhere, help keep up with the local capacity requirements by supplying electricity at moments when the power plants just aren't enough to meet demand. And provided that the CPUC, I don't even know what that is, uh, uh, oh, well, that'd be the California Power uh, Utility Commission, uh, or, I'm sorry, Public Utility Commission, uh, approves the project, they'd be ready uh, between late 2019 and late 2020. So, of course, uh, they said that it might be a daunting feat to launch a storage battery system this large, Tesla's Gigafactory has already been blamed for a worldwide battery shortage, and it won't help matters if the company is producing even more power packs on top of the batteries needed for the rapidly growing electric vehicle production. So, yeah, that's kind of another thing, is that batteries are seriously the future. Right now, we're still on uh, lithium-ion batteries. A lot of what's, uh, you know, a lot of what's out there is seriously just like laptop batteries strung together in a series and that is a power pack essentially and so when you start to put them not just in laptops not just in tablets not just in battery backups for outlets and things like that but also you start to put them into generators you put them into electric vehicles you put them into bikes you put them into everything you're going to have a shortage so We'll see, we'll see if they can even do this, because if they run out of the raw ingredients, well, hey, it's uh, not a good recipe. So with that being said, they said that uh, should Tesla pull this off, though, it could both clinch more business and make a better case for storage batteries attached to major electrical grids. And again, the point of these battery packs isn't so much to run the entire grid off of a Tesla power pack but rather it's to even everything out. A lot of the cost that comes with electricity is the fact that you're not always 24 seven running your television, your AC, your blender, your, uh, you know, your electric cooktop, your lights, whatever. And all those minute fluctuations carried across an entire grid means that you have a lot of electricity either going to waste or just a lot of overhead in controlling these things that if you could just even everything out, have a constant flow, and you don't have to worry about those fluctuations thanks to batteries, it would make everything cheaper across the board. So let's hope Tesla does this because I don't know about you, but electricity could certainly stand to be cheaper. So... Let's see how this works. So with, uh, let's see, I live on the coast. It's much cooler here. Yeah, uh, you know, and again, about this heat wave, uh, we, it, it's funny because you look at the, uh, the satellite images or at least the, the temperature images and they kind of overlay the temperatures. And some, part of the, some parts of the country, like even a couple miles away from us, we're in Asheville, North Carolina, but even a couple miles away in Tennessee, they have temperatures of like 111. Like, I think they just close the whole place down. They're just going to move the whole place to Canada. But no, it's 
it's super, super hot. And then we're in the mountains. So it's like 82 degrees here. So much, much more bearable as opposed to like 111. So, you know, not everyone is, is experiencing this heat wave, but at the same time, it's, uh, you know, these temperature fluctuations are especially rough on power grids and things like that. So there you go. And again, I did these Tesla stories because both of them had a slight bend to, uh, you know, being positive because there's, there's a lot of stories here that are not as positive. And I think it's time to get to some of these. So let's talk about this one. So this one and I'm surprised that the internet is surprised because this happened a little while ago and they admitted to doing it. And then now people are shocked that they're rolling it out to everyone. So this was this. And the worrisome thing here is that the data being collected on what they're doing is coming from individual people. They're not coming from announcements from Comcast. They're not coming from press releases. They're coming from individuals who notice a change and who are tech savvy enough to record their results and compare and contrast. Essentially, consumers keeping an eye on Comcast and seeing what Comcast is doing to their mobile data. So this one from Ars Technica, John Brodkin. But as I said, I remember the story from a couple of months ago where especially with netflix um, this happens to any mobile streaming video uh, i.e youtube or hulu or things like that but i remember they were testing it explicitly with netflix a couple of months ago and people were asking questions why is comcast throttling my netflix connection giving me standard definition instead of high definition and comcast said without missing a beat they said, oh, we're testing some things. Uh, some users will experience standard and uh, you know, standard definition as opposed to high definition. Don't worry, it's not for everyone. We're just testing some things. Well, lo and behold, now looks like that's going to be a company-wide, service-wide policy. So if you have Comcast, you need to listen up. Because they say that uh, they will start throttling mobile video and will charge extra for HD streams. And beyond that, it will also limit video and hotspot speed. So if you have Comcast and you have, and you are one of those unlimited plans, honestly, this is the, I, I, I don't even know if it's the worst part, but it's a big part. If you are an unlimited Comcast data user, this affects you more than buy the gig customers. And that's a term that Comcast uses where if you pay by the gigabyte, they will give you higher speeds than if you are an unlimited user. Like they'll throttle you, but if you switch over to one where you're actually paying for the data, they'll unthrottle you completely. So obviously that's, uh, you know, that is at the heart of it. And you know, and of course, as uh, someone in our chat room just mentioned, paying for a service and then not getting that service that you pay for, this should be illegal. One of the things that, and, and, and trust me, this has been a problem for many years beyond the current FCC, beyond, uh, you know, administrations come and go, but this continues to be a problem. When they have unlimited, Comcast actually just announced a couple of different unlimited plans. And this article does a good job of putting unlimited in quotes where they have like unlimited plus, unlimited extra, unlimited uh, certain or other. Unlimited doesn't strictly mean unlimited. And in many cases, there are different tiers of um, it. It's confusing because when you think unlimited, you think of like a term like infinity. And if you've ever taken math before, there's positive infinity and negative infinity. But there's not like infinity plus or infinity up to a certain number. Uh, unlimited, infinity, these terms have definitions that don't strictly apply to the plans that they're associated with. That's a big frustration. So yeah, that word doesn't mean what you think it means. Uh, 
Yeah. So the way that I always put it to to uh, to my friends and family is that it's unlimited until you reach the limit, and then you're throttled. So it's unlimited until you hit that threshold. So now that threshold is uh, is changing, and it's an ever shifting goalpost. And now here's here's where we are, uh, according to the article, where Comcast Xfinity mobile service is imposing new speed limits on video watching and personal hotspot usage. So the short version is that videos will be throttled to 480p and as they so nicely put it, DVD quality, or as everyone else would put it, 480p on a phone is called standard definition. You know that thing that you haven't had to watch since, oh, I don't know, 20, 2012? Yeah, that's going to be your standard. And they said that on all Comcast mobile plans, unless you pay extra, while Comcast Unlimited plan will limit mobile hotspot speeds to 600 kilobits per second, or probably kilobytes. Kilobits. Yeah, probably kilobits. So, yeah, think about that. 600 kilobits per second. A lot of web pages are going to load slowly. Like, and I'm just talking web surfing. I'm not even talking streaming music, streaming video, streaming uh, video games, anything more intensive than email checking and casual web browsing is going to be very, very painful when you're at almost half a megabyte per second or yeah, half a megabyte per second, it's going to be painful. I mean, 600 kilobytes, oh, back in like 1996, 1998, I was getting like 52 kilobits, and then they upgraded us to 512, and we thought we were awesome, and that was like in like 98 to 2000, and then eventually we got DSL, and we were blazing at like three megabytes per second. The fact that we have to go back to 20-year-old speeds is atrocious but here's the thing you don't have to go back to 20 year old speeds if you pay 12 dollars per gigabyte used then you are more than welcome to stream as much as you want at 4g speeds and those 4g speeds i think are like uh let's see they have them listed here 4g speeds are uh hmm much much faster yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't have the exact, I think it's like 20 megabits per second is 4G speeds. But either way, they said that Comcast last year, last year began selling mobile plans with data, voice, and texting. Comcast doesn't operate its own cell network, so it resells Verizon wireless service. Uh, the new speed limits could help Comcast save money on the reselling fees it pays to Verizon. In a statement to Ars Technica, Comcast said it's making the changes to help us maintain the low price point of Xfinity Mobile. So this is definitely a cost-cutting measure. So they said that, uh, yep, Comcast said that 480p is consistent with standard unlimited plans across carriers. Uh, I don't know if that's true. And that it's making the changes to bring Comcast offering in line with the rest of the industry. Although... I, I'm not exactly a businessman. Of course, you know, we run Computer America here and we're happy with what we do, but I get that it's a cost-saving measure, but if you could provide the service before and you, like, there are a couple options. You could either raise the price and keep the service you have or lower the service you have and keep the same price. And they're choosing to lower the surface they have and keep the price. That makes people a lot more angry than if you said, hey, we have a clearly better service. Um, you have to pay a little bit more money. I, I, I don't know which is the more attractive offer to consumers, but it just seems like degrading your service that you are more than capable of providing uh, to keep a lower price point doesn't seem like the way that a lot of people would want you to go. So, and let's see, charge more, uh, charge more for less and people will complain and it keeps paying the bills. So yeah, it, that, that, that seems to be the way they're, they're keeping their, sir, they're keeping their prices, but then giving you a worse service. And in some cases, again, 600 kilobits per second, a much worse service. So we're going to, uh, yeah, we're going to get back here and tell you exactly what you're now getting. But in the meantime, everyone, 
We'll be right back. Hey, everyone, stay tuned. Computer America. Greece is cheap. But the airfare costs a fortune. Paris? Not much closer, and again, airfare... What about Puerto Vallarta? Let's face it, flying anywhere is just too expensive. Wait, what's this? Low-cost airlines. With one call to low-cost airlines, you'll drastically slash your travel costs. We're talking insanely low airline prices to any of your favorite destinations. Where would you like to go? London, Rome, Costa Rica, Australia? Wow, that's cheap. So why wait? Call now to learn how crazy cheap it is to fly anywhere in the U.S. or international. Our prices are so low, we can't publish them. The only way to get them is to call to instantly hear the most amazing best deals on airlines travel. It's that easy. So call now and start packing. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. 800-215-4461. That's 800-215-4461. We are all Brother Wolf. Ten years ago, a group of locals banded together to create positive change. We took animals into our homes, held adoption events at local retailers, and talked to the community about our mission to help build a no-kill Asheville. A decade later, we have achieved so many victories for animals in need. There's been so much progress, yet there's still so much to do. As part of our year-long celebration, we encourage you to become a member of our special Compassionate Circle program. With a monthly donation of $10 or more, you will have behind-the-scenes access to the work we are doing at Brother Wolf. Our goal is to reach 1,000 members because we receive no government funding. Working together, we can help build and sustain no-kill communities. Learn more at CompassionateCircle.BWAR.org. We are a 501c3 tax-deductible organization. And welcome back to the uh, Computer America show. We are 32 minutes past the hour. And as I always like to remind you, uh, if you missed any part of today's show and you feel like going back and listening to it, first of all, thank you. Second of all, uh, check out the Computer America show wherever podcasts are heard, be that Google Play, iTunes, uh, you know, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, so many more. You you can, of course, listen to it there. Oh, uh, Blog Talk Radio. And uh, yeah, hey, more than happy to uh, to bring that to you. So in the meantime, we are, of course, going to uh, finish up the story here about Comcast, where essentially, if you're a current Comcast customer, they have made some changes that will affect you, especially, although, you know, and almost entirely, if you are an unlimited user. So by, they, again, they have the service called Buy the Gig. If you pay for your data per gigabyte used, your speeds are essentially going to stay the same because the more data you use, the more money you give them. So to them, you are going to want to give that person as much data as they can possibly consume. Whereas for unlimited users, you're going to get 20 gigabytes of, of data, which is, you know, for an average family, you know, for an average family of four, if you're pretty judicious with your data, 20 gigs isn't that bad, but if you are a heavy user, then you're going to start seeing some some changes, including the fact that uh, streaming video from YouTube, Netflix, Hulu, things like that, uh, only available at 480p, so standard definition, no high definition. Uh, and again, once you, uh, let's see, the, the, uh, the tethered or hotspot streaming data is limited to 100, I'm sorry, 1.5 megabits per second downstream and 750 kilobits per second upstream at all times. So that's after the 20 gigs. So up to the 20 gigs, you're good to go. After the 20 gigs, you're throttled. Uh, they said that while Comcast is imposing the video and hotspot changes shortly after the repeal of net neutrality rules, the rules may not have stopped this form of throttling. The rules ban throttling, but they had an exception for reasonable network management where the major wireless carriers have imposed various videos and I'm sorry, various video and hotspot limits on their mobile network without being punished by the federal communication commission. 
Comcast is trying to convince customers that the new speed limits will be good for them, saying that, uh, you know, 480p video limit can help you save money if you pay by the gig, and it could help unlimited data customers stay under the 20 gigabit th throttling threshold. So, they said that uh, on the 600 kilobits per second tethering limit, Comcast told customers that at this speed, you'll conserve data so that it takes longer to reach the 20 gigabit threshold, but you'll still be able to do many of the online activities you enjoy. It, it's kind of like the end of life, quality of life thing. It's like, we can keep you alive for 20 years, but we're gonna have to put you in an iron lung and you're not gonna be able to move at all. It's like, it's quality of life versus, you know, length of life. And I don't know what kind of quality of life your phone's gonna have at 600 kilobits per second. It's just, it just seems so, so backwater. But anyways, those, those are some new limitations they're putting on you. And uh, I had another point to make about this, but yeah, you know, again, if you are a Comcast uh, Xfinity user, especially unlimited, these will affect you. So there you have it. All right. So there's that one. Let's talk about some weird stuff because this is all kind of, you know, consumer kind of stuff. Let's talk about some weird, some weirdness. So this coming out of China and admittedly, trust me, I've poured over enough, uh, you know, enough articles, stories, uh, weirdness that you can't trust everything that comes out of China. They simply uh, exaggerate or falsify data or do things that, you know, uh, the, the scientific community, they can't reproduce a lot of the, uh, a lot of the science coming out of China. But at the same time, they are doing advancements. And so some things you have to sit up and take notice of and say, wow, maybe they can really do that. That's super weird. So if you're watching the video portion, there looks to be a gentleman pointing uh, uh, some kind of assault rifle, but instead of a tip that would normally spray uh, little bullets of death, this one has what appears to be the world's biggest mag light you have ever seen attached to the end of it. So, and that's because this coming from uh, South China Morning Post, saying that China brings Star Wars to life with a laser AK-47 that can set fire to targets a kilometer away. Or for us Americans here, I think that's like 0.6 of a mile. So a little bit over half of a mile away, they can light something on fire. Pretty cool. So they said that the uh, China has developed a new portable laser weapon that can zap a target from nearly a kilometer away. And they said that the ZKZM500, rolls right off the tongue, laser assault rifle is classified as being non-lethal, but produces an energy beam that cannot be seen by the naked eye, but can pass through windows and can, and can cause the instant carbonization of human skin and tissue. They say non-lethal, but I feel like if any part of me instant Oh, let's see. What's the term they used here? Instantly carbonized. I would be super, super sad. I, 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 I don't know. So ten years ago, its capabilities would have been the the uh, in the uh, purviews of of sci-fi films. But one laser weapon scientist said that the new device is able to burn through clothes in a split second. Yet the fabric is flammable. The whole person will be set on fire. Scientist, you look at something and you say, can we do this? And you don't look at something and say, should we do this? My word. So an invisible beam, it's not even like it's tinted red or green like a usual laser, but instead it will set people's clothes on fire from half a mile away. You could instantly was it spontaneously combust someone and they would never even know. They would think that they had invoked the wrath of some higher deity by suddenly being lit on fire. You can do so much stuff. If this proves to be true, the special effects at Disney World, I expect them to be nothing less than amazing. 
because this is awesome. So they said that the 15 millimeter caliber weapon weighs about six pounds and is about the same as an AK-47 and has the range of about 800 meters or about half a mile and could be mounted on cars, boats, and planes. So someone in the chat asked, can I mount this on my grand, on my grand caravan? Because apparently he runs into enough trouble in his grand caravan that he needs a laser weapon. But yes, this can be mounted on cars, boats, and planes. Hmm. And uh, yeah, is about the size of an AK-47, so it's also portable. So if you need to take it with you, there you go. Saying that it is now ready for mass production, and the first units are likely to be given to anti-terrorism squads in the Chinese armed police. You know, we've talked about the Chinese before when it comes to their quote-unquote anti-terrorism. They have a lot of uh, a lot of technology they're using to control their population. Uh, they produce a lot. They, they are the topic of a lot of conversation, but it's never too far to point out that they have very egregious human rights violations. Their population as a whole has much fewer freedoms than those in other industrial countries enjoy. And China as a government is very interested in keeping their population in check by any means necessary. And in recent months, in recent years, that's been through technology, through categorizing people, through facial recognition, by uh, social credit scores. And now it looks like by quote unquote non-lethal means that if you could, you know, hey, you see a dissenter and you want to set them on fire, hey, you know, you do what you can. So, because the laser has been tu uh, tuned to an invisible frequency, it produces absolutely no sound. Nobody will know where the attack came from. It will look like an accident, the re another researcher said. The scientist requested not to be named due to the sensitivity of the project. Oh my goodness. So, they said that it could be also be used to go, uh, in covert military operations. The beam is powerful enough to burn through a gas tank and ignite the fuel storage in a military airport. So, a lot of possibilities. They said that the cost is about $15,000 per unit. It can fire more than 1,000 quote-unquote shots, each lasting no more than two seconds. So... They said that it will be charged with a lithium battery pack, similar to those found in smartphones. So yeah, many, many phones are powered by a lithium battery. And the problem is, is that a lot of lithium batteries, especially when they're ex uh, expended very quickly, have a tendency to catch fire themselves. So these things are probably gonna be pretty hit or miss. So there you go, uh, let's see, a. Technical de uh, department containing basic information about the weapon was released last month. And let's see, uh, the weapon has a range of about 500 meters. It can fire several hundred shots. And I think we're going to leave this one there. But you know, the article goes into some of the other technology that China has been using to, uh, you know, to monitor not just its citizens, but, you know, everything. And, yeah, you know, China. I, I have a strong feeling that as much as we complain about technology here in the United States, if you want to see technology done wrong, watch what happens in China over the next couple of decades. That's going to be the real test about, because there's a very centralized power who has every incentive to use technology for the betterment and instillment of itself as opposed to the betterment of its people. So I feel like if you want to see technology done wrong, yeah, uh, keep an eye on what China is doing. So yeah, invisible lasers that can set fire to people half a mile away. Why not talk about that? So, all right, there's that one. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, some of the, all right. Sometimes we like to bring up cryptocurrency here. And about a year ago, we talked to a lot of companies. Uh, that was during the rise of Bitcoin. For those of you who don't know, Bitcoin is 
you know, we talk about it on our Linux program. Bitcoin is open source. If you want to look at the source code, if you want to copy the source code and make small tweaks, you are more than welcome to. If you want to download the source code of Bitcoin, change all the names to Bencoin, and you want to put out the Bencoin exclusive that will work the exact same way as Bitcoin, but it will only be good for Ben Bucks and Ben Coin will allow you to buy things at the Ben store, then hey, you are more than welcome to do that. This led to a lot of companies, and yes, we had a lot of them on the show, um, sometimes multiple uh, companies weekly that came on the program talking about their new cryptocurrency. Well, this has led to an interesting kind of thing that has led people to further compare cryptocurrency to dot com, uh, you know, to the, to the dot com bubble. So this from CNBC talking about over 800, 800 cryptocurrencies are now dead as Bitcoin is 70% off its record high. And I know that we have explained many times that Bitcoin is not the entirety of cryptocurrency. But when it comes to the price of things, they're always compared. I'm sorry, they're always compared to the price of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin may not be the entirety of what it comes, you know, uh, of what, uh, I'm sorry, Bitcoin may not be the entirety of cryptocurrency, but at the same time, it's a huge, huge indicator of how the of how the industry is doing. So, with that being said, 800, 800 cryptocurrencies are now dead because of the recent sell-off. So, a lot of them came about when Bitcoin went from like 2,000 or 3,000 or something like that up to 10,000 and then shot up even further up to like 20,000. Like they were exciting times. People were waking up every day. And if you were heavily inv invested in Bitcoin, people made millions of dollars over the course of like hours. It was an exciting time. A lot of other uh, initial coin offerings offered to do the exact same thing. And that led to, according to this article here, about $4 billion being raised in initial coin offerings. So that's $4 billion from investment firms, capital firms, uh, everyday people, $4 billion in 2017 to about $12 billion in 2018 so far. So they said that, however, hundreds of these projects are now dead because they were scams, a joke, or the product hasn't materialized. Dead Coins is a website that lists all the cryptocurrencies that fall into these categories, and so far it has identified just over 800 digital tokens that it considers dead. These coins are worthless and trade at less than one cent. And the reason that they trade at less than one cent is that you can buy them and someone will probably sell you their backlog of these cryptocurrencies. But unless the product, uh, but unless the project is revived, unless someone starts to develop it again, unless someone starts to spend advertising money to get the word out about it, uh, it finds a partner, it finds a use. A lot of these cryptocurrencies just simply don't have a use. Unless it gets all of those things, those cryptocurrencies are, you might as well be trading World of Warcraft gold, you might as well be trading uh, uh, Neopet coins, you might as well be trading uh, wooden nickels that you found under your bed. They're just useless. So, let's see. Uh, some of the recent bearish sentiment came after two South Korean cryptocurrency exchanges were hacked. Uh, ICOs are incredibly risky investments. We've seen a number of ICOs just be complete scams where you know, they just say, hey, we have an initial coin offering and investors would throw money at it. And what they would modestly think of as a, I'm sorry, what they would modestly think of as a $2 million investment, which, you know, to an investment firm with billions of dollars in capital, isn't that much. They were hoping that by throwing $2 million at it, they could eventually cash out for 10 million, 20 million, 50 million. And they'd 
earn a tiny profit, well, the coin offering people saw that and they just said, hey, we have an ICO, give us $2 million, you'll make that back in a week's time. And they just ran away with $2 million. So that happened all the time. So uh, with that being said, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. So obviously people have compared it to the dot-com bubble. A lot of dot-com services and websites and things like that uh, came and went with this, you know, with the same idea. The problem I have with that though, is that we can look back at the dot-com bubble and say that was a bad thing. But now here we are, uh, you know, um, what is it? 20 years later and say, hey, the dot-com services, uh, you know, online services and websites and products available through the internet, that's such a big part of our daily lives that it surpassed uh, in-person retail shopping numbers. So I feel like by comparing that, you're still giving people that slight hope, that slight promise that cryptocurrency is going to be the way of the future and that eventually it's going to be everywhere. There's no guarantee of that, but hey, you know, it's always been a gamble. And if you feel like playing the lottery, go for it. Because just like the lottery, you have a lot of losers and a few very happy winners. So with, uh, and, and, and by the way, as, uh, as Melter of Snowflake says in the chat room, now that I finally have a computer powerful enough to mine, it's worthless. Um, yeah, that, that was... That was a big part of mining, and if you tried to build a computer in the past year, one of the big problems with, uh, with crypto mining was that if you wanted a graphics card, let's say if you wanted a, 10, uh, a 1080 uh, NVIDIA GTX 1080 or 1080i, they were not only sold out across all retailers, but if you wanted to buy one secondhand, which are the only people that had them, they were selling them for like a 50% markup above market price because crypto miners were buying them and then using them for crypto mining. And they would be able to make essentially that price back and then some just by owning the cards. So now that the price of Bitcoin has fallen from $20,000, from $15,000, from $10,000, having those cards isn't guaranteed to pay themselves off. So now you may have a card and hey, they're finally affordable again, but mining Bitcoin or mining any kind of cryptocurrency probably isn't affordable if you want some kind of large, large, large operation. So there you go. So let's go ahead and, uh, and move on to some of these other stories. Here's one that I'm keeping a very, very close eye on, and we've had uh, Sandy Berger come on the show talk about it. We've had a number of, uh, of articles about this, but there's a company called MoviePass, and MoviePass is, um, is a service. They, you sign up for it. They send you a card in the mail. You take that card to a movie theater. And you say, hello, I'd like to see so-and-so movie. They swipe the card and essentially they send the price of the movie ticket to MoviePass headquarters. MoviePass pays for it. And from you, they simply collect they simply collect the monthly fee, which is in many cases less than the amount of a ticket or two to the movies. You can see where someone who maybe is an avid movie watcher would quickly outpay or be more expensive than someone who maybe treats it like a gym membership and they have it, but they never use it, but they keep paying for it. Um, yeah, MoviePass really never had a chance. So here's one of their last chances saying that MoviePass, here we go, uh, MoviePass tries a financial Hail Mary to keep itself afloat. And let's see, let's see, let's see. And uh, yeah, they said that there's no doubt about it. MoviePass is bleeding cash and there's no guarantee that it's growing subscriber base or investors will keep, will keep going. And by most accounts, 
uh, yeah, and, and by, and by, yeah, and so by, uh, yeah, by most standards, they said that MoviePass has enough cash to last, like, you know, we talked earlier about Tesla having enough, having enough cash to last through the year. Uh, MoviePass was much dire. It was like, they only had enough cash to run through, like, a couple of weeks. It was really, really bad. And so MoviePass parent company, uh, Helios and Matheson Analytics, has filed a statement with the SEC that let it sell as much as $1.2 billion in equity in debt securities over the next three years. And this doesn't guarantee that it will raise $1.2 billion. Rather, it would provide a new avenue for raising cash if it doesn't think other options are enough. So essentially with this, they're saying, hey, and, and this, is the Hail Mary, this is the Hail Mary part. They're going to investors and saying, hey, we are going to accrue $1.2 billion in debt over the next couple of years. Buy some of this debt from us. Essentially, give us uh, $200 million. Give us $50 million. Give us $100 million. And we will pay you back with interest. And yeah, that is another way that they're going to essentially say, uh, we can keep afloat and eventually we'll turn a profit and pay back our debt. But in the meantime, we need cash to keep going. Well, as a disclaimer, they said that... Uh, and well, they said that uh, the uh, the article uh, the article is from Engadget, and Gadget's parent company has a stake in MoviePass. But while the sales are optional, there may be a more of a matter of when than if. The finally comes hot on the heels of a 164 million dollar bond sale, and it risks being delisted from the Nasdaq as its stock price has plummeted from nearly 39 dollars per share to just 26 cents as of this writing. Folks, if you have ever needed a more concrete example of why this could possibly, possibly not succeed, is that it started at $39 per share, and now it's 26 cents. I have seen junk stock with less of a curve than that. It is crazy. So they said that, uh, simply speaking, backers aren't confident that its wildly low-priced movie subscription will lead to profit, even with elements like surge pricing playing a role. This could buy it precious time if it figures out a better business model or at least delay the end. Um, this is kind of the way of tech companies. A lot of them don't turn a profit for a long time. Uh, Amazon just recently, like seriously, a couple of years ago, Amazon, even though it had already taken over the world, had not turned a profit. Uh, Twitter, I think just this January, turned its first profit. Uh, many, many companies simply run on dump trucks of burning cash from capital and angel investors. And very, very few tech companies actually seem to turn it around and start to make money on the back end. Um, that's not a bad thing. It just means that starting a company, getting that user base, and starting with, uh, you know, starting somewhere is super critical, but then turning that into something that pays is even harder. Because, you know, you could look at uh, things like Pandora or Spotify or things like that. They, they have the same issues as well. So anyways, the point is, movie pass. there is, I, I, honestly, uh, we are not financial advice or investors. Um, yeah, don't buy, uh, as a consumer, you can buy in a movie pass. Maybe it'll work for you. Good luck with that. But don't expect it to stick around for long. So everyone everyone thank you so much and by the way uh to our chatters thank you chatters for joining us in the chat room if you'd like to talk with us and you know be a part of the show ask us questions bring news stories to our attention feel free to at twitch.tv forward slash computer america 
And folks, until next time, be sure to catch us same time, same place, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. And everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much. And we can't wait to uh, catch you back here next time. So tomorrow is our Gamer Tuesday with Corey Gallagher, where we are going to be talking about a number of things. And then again, just to be clear, Wednesday, July 4th, Computer America is off. So everyone, until next time, have a great day. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone.